Amazing. Okay, so that's that's the the baseline there. How do we and we could very quickly move into the world of manipulation, and that's not what I'm not interested in. That I'm, I'm more interested in, in creating uh, better buying experiences, and I'm sure some of this works better in person than it does kind of over a Skype call or over a phone call. But is there anything we can do as uh, salespeople, uh, as business leaders, to make our customers happier when we engage with them, other than perhaps obvious stuff, like perhaps, I, I'm assuming this is the case, but smiling seems to be somewhat contagious. Um, and that m hopefully it affects the emotions of the people that we're engaging with. Is there anything like that that we can do to, I guess, mirror, get people to mirror our own emotions? Yeah, so I have to tell you that the more I learn about this, the more I think that smiling is, I often think of, I, I, one day I'm going to write a book called The Tyranny of Happiness, I think. You know, like uh, when people smile for the purpose of trying to get me to smile, really what I want to do is give them the <laughs> finger. Honestly, I, I don't like being manipulated that way. And I don't think people like being manipulated, actually. So here's what I would say. We are social animals. We regulate each other's nervous systems. In a way... You could think about, you know, the best thing for a human nervous system is another human. The worst thing for a human nervous system is also another human. So if you want to make your customers more comfortable and able to engage in the kind of thoughtful um, weighing of pros and cons so that they'll be satisfied with a purchase that they make, your job is to help regulate their nervous systems. The way I describe this is body budgeting. Your brain is running a budget for your body. It's not budgeting money, it's budgeting salt and glucose and water and oxygen and all the things your body needs to run. And we make deposits into that body budget by sleeping and eating and we make withdrawals. The two biggest, uh, most expensive things your brain can do is move your body like when you're walking or getting out of bed in the morning or exercising and learning. So when you're giving a client a lot of information and they have to process that information and make a decision, that is expensive metabolically speaking. And you can make that process more expensive or less expensive for them, depending on how responsive you are to them. Um, so, you know, we can make metaphorical deposits and withdrawals in other people's body budgets. So rather than smiling, I would suggest, first of all, breathing, um, breathing in a, at, a, at a good slow pace because we mirror each other's breathing patterns, right? So if you and I were actually in a room together and we liked each other and we trusted each other, we would, um, our, our physiological signals would, um, would, would synchronize. If you're really worked up, I would become really worked up. If you're really calm and you're breathing, you know, at a really good pace, then I would become calmer and breathe at a good pace. You know, the we're not aware of doing these things, but <clears throat> it's very, very possible to um, influence people that way. So, for example, when I was training to be a therapist, you know, a million years ago in another life, um, one of the things I learned to do was breathe um, at a pace of about six to eight um, seconds, because the one way to calm your body down is to breathe um, in a very paced way. And actually, you know, Navy SEALs use this in order to calm themselves down. That it's really the only way that we know of that you can sort of slower, you know, lower your heart rate, sort of get your, bring your body back down into a, a more comfortable range. So what I would suggest is if you wanna have a successful um, selling um, episode, whatever that means to you, you probably want to do it in a way that leaves the person, leaves your client um, or customer feeling not happy, but comfortable, comfortable, which means that you reflect back what they say, you pace your own breathing, so they pace their breathing, and you basically help them make it a less 
metabolically taxing event. So you you may may not you, you'll have experienced this, I'm sure, but you may not be uh, consciously aware of all the training that's gone in the past with with sales training. So perhaps ten years ago, we would talk. Not we. I wasn't involved in this. Uh, this is one of the reasons I started the podcast. Have people like yourself on to actually unwrap the science behind some of this. But a lot of sales training was about. Uh, mirroring the person that you're engaging with and, and all these like weird like tricks and, and hacks and kind of things. Then it went to uh, more of a discussion. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on this in a second on things like uh, discussing mirror neurons, but it would be a non ex, a non scientist talking about mirror neurons, trying to use anecdotes and metaphors to describe something that they don't know what they're talking about. So, this is why this is really interesting to me to talk to the, about the actual science of why perhaps some of this may work, may not work. What are your thoughts on the likes of uh, the the efficacy or the the effectiveness of mirroring body language, things like this? And are mirror are mirror neurons relevant to any of this whatsoever? Mirror neurons don't exist. <laughs> There's nothing in your brain called a mirror neuron. Yeah. There are <laughs> neurons in your brain that do what mirror neurons are supposed to do, but they are in many, many, many parts of your brain. There's nothing special. So what I'm trying to say is the function is there, but there are no special neurons that perform this function, okay? Your brain has the capacity to change the firing of its own neurons, okay? If I ask you, to imagine a Macintosh apple of the sort that you eat. So in your mind's eye, can you imagine a red apple that you would eat? Okay. And can you imagine picking that apple up, mm -hmm. biting into the apple, hearing the crunch of the apple, maybe tasting the, maybe it's tart with a little sweetness. Can you imagine that in your mind's eye? I can. And it's probably happening what you're trying to make happen of I'm slightly salivating as, uh, as as you describe it. Yeah. Why do you think you're salivating? Because your brain has changed the firing of your neurons, right? Your brain is changing. If we had your head in a brain scanner, we would see that portions of the visual system in your brain would be very active, even though there actually is no apple. Um, just by merely saying the word apple, this conjures um, an image in your head. Mm -hmm. Your brain, um, upon hearing me talk about the crunch and the taste, you know, is actually changing the firing of neurons without the apple there to actually make you salivate to prepare to digest the apple when you eat it. Your brain is basically what we would call simulating. This is what scientists call simulating. It's a fancy word for a bunch of things we do every day, but this is actually how, it's exactly the same process that your brain is, undergoes when it's making sense of information from your body and the world. So when you um, see someone smile or you see the raise of an eyebrow or you, you see someone move, what your brain is doing is simulating to prepare to deal with that person's action. That's what so-called motor neurons do, but every neuron pro in your brain, you could think of doing that, it, acting in that way. It's not something specific to the neurons that are in that little spot. And I guess the, the thing to say is this, that it is true that if you stick two people in a room who don't know each other, but through the course of conversation, they, they, they trust each other, they like each other, it's true that they will spontaneously mirror each other's actions. Like, let's say, um, Will, that you, you know, put your hand up to your face. I might put my hand up to, you know, flick my hair. And then let's say I flick my hair. You might, and I, I flick my hair and I look, I look to the right. You might also slightly turn your body to the right. I mean, people don't mirror in an exact way, but there is, probabilistically speaking, some right? But that kind of mirroring, if you, if you actually deliberately try to do it, people notice and they think it's weird. <laughs> of course. You know, it's, it's really weird. It's super weird. Isn't it's it? really weird. <laughs> However, I can really, I can assure you that if you, when you're 
trying to calm someone down and and help them. Well, put it this way: I work out with a with a a, a coach. I worked out with a coach for fifteen years. Right, Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning. Okay, I am much more efficient in my workout when he's there than when he isn't there. It's not just because he's telling me what to do. I'm actually stronger when he's there and I can do more when he's there. And it's because he's um, providing body budgeting support for me in a way that I'm, I'm not consciously tracking. When you lose someone that you love, when that person leaves you, they, you break up or they die, you feel like you've lost a part of yourself because you have. You've lost someone who was tending to your body budget and now you have to do it on your own. And it, you feel, it feels painful because it is. It's, it's, it's harder. So if you, the kind of mirroring that you want to do with, a, with someone you don't know very well um, would be more like staying calm, modulating your voice, modulate your breathing, um, and that will make it easier for them to do the same. If they get worked up and you follow them, that just leads to a cycle of everybody getting worked up as opposed to taking a step back and taking a deep breath, right? With with little kids, like with babies, actually, even with my daughter, sometimes I don't depend on mirroring. I get her to come to me. I give her a hug and I actually breathe slowly and I get her to pace my breathing, which when she was a baby, all I needed to do was put her on my chest and breathe and she would calm down just by my breathing. Now that she's 22, I can just say to her, you know, do you want a hug? And then we stand there and we breathe together for, for a minute. And then she's, she feels she's calmer. Now you can't, obviously you can't do that with a, with a customer, <laughs> but, but what you can do is you can, you can, you, if you keep your nervous system calm, you're basically providing support for the other person's nervous system. Mm -hmm.